This is one of two presentations on enigmatic non-narrative sculpture. And enigmatic uh, means something ab about how the object fascinates you visually, pulls you in, compels you. It doesn't really let you know what it is. It still leaves some questions uh, for you to, to ponder. Um, Non-narrative meaning it's not trying to tell you a story. It's not really an object that looks like something identifiable. It's not a cat. It's not a sailboat. It's not. It's not anything that you recognize. It's enigmatic, and it's. It doesn't have a story to tell you. It's purely operating on a sort of visual presence. So those are that. Those are the requirements of this assignment. And here is a. Um, an example of uh, one of those. This is um, the only piece I put in that I've made. Uh, this is sitting in my garden uh, that I made in relationship to this assignment. So I thought it'd be an interesting way to start out. Now we're, we're going to look at a lot of Japanese sculpture. Uh, there are a lot of Japanese sculptors who have uh, worked in this fashion. So um, I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit better there. Um, so here uh, you can see uh, work by, um, let's see, uh, Takaguchi Kazuo. And this is another view of the same piece. And you can see it's a kind of full, uh, almost like an inflated form. And um, it has a, a point, three point stand, which is a very effective way of uh, making sure something is very, very stable. Um, but it, it has uh, it has a couple of things going on for it that are really exciting. One is the the kind of composition has uh, negative space underneath the piece, so it has this 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 drawing you down below a, a piece. The piece itself is very full, voluminous, and almost looks heavy, except for it's light on its tips there. It's got three points that are lifting it into space. So it has this kind of juxtaposition or this contrast between a sense of mass and a sense of lightness. Um, the other thing that you see in, Kazuo, uh, in Kazuo's piece here is that um, he has uh, created a surface uh, that is very, um, uh, it's very intriguing, it's very engaging. It's a pattern of these uh, parallel scratches, which I suspect he did by, uh, once the piece was was crafted and, and smooth, he then uh, went very carefully and diligently all over the piece making these, uh, these two marks, uh, vertical then horizontal, vertical then horizontal, and making lines of these all around, way around the piece. And then um, he put some white slip, he painted it with white slip and then gently scraped it so that the white slip only stayed in these grooves that he created. And in so doing, what, he, what, what comes up for us is that every ceramic sculpture is a, is a balance between the form itself and the, uh, the finish, the, the decoration. Sometimes it's something like this, which is a, a pattern that is inlaid into the surface. And sometimes it has to do with um, doing some kind of contrasting textural surface. We'll see some examples of that. So let's see what else we have here. This is a piece by Yasuhisa, Kohayama, Ko Kohayama. And um, these are really exciting pieces. They have a lovely kind of asymmetry about them. Uh, they do, uh, they almost look uh, winged, though we're not looking for a narrative or association. But you can see in this piece here, you can see um, this wedge-like shape is tipped up at an angle. And there's a mass to the right and a narrowing across the whole form to the left. And then there is a, a, an opening at the top. So uh, he, he, this is something, uh, actually it's a she, Yashu Hisa, uh, who, um, and this is a, a kind of form that she visits. Um, let's see. Uh, again and again. So she does um, this kind of 
leaning form, a uh, narrow foot, um, kind of a, a, a wing, uh, more mass on one side, a lighter, thinner, very, it thins out quite, quite a bit on the other side. And then there's a kind of uh, geometry and some contrasting texture. It's really a, a well crafted piece. Here's yet another one. So you can see her exploring this theme um, again and again and discovering new ways to uh, get some uh, intrigue with this approach. <clears throat> now, this is a Japanese American. Uh, I think he's Japanese, but he's lived uh, much of his late, his mature career in the United States, mostly in Indiana. Uh, uh, or is it Nebraska? Uh, this is June Kaniko. And uh, these are uh, large sculptures uh, that are very minimal. They're just these lovely soft forms. He calls them dango, which is Japanese for uh, cake. Um, and so they're these little, like uh, he's thinking of them as rice cakes. And they're, they're um, really, for me, they're more about painting than they are about um, about the form. The form is pretty easily understood and grasped. Uh, it, it, it has a lot of effect because of its scale. A lot of them are human scale. They can be up to six feet tall. Uh, he's actually made them uh, 10 and 12 feet tall as well. He's made them enormous. And, uh, but he is a master with glazes and color. And you can see that in these examples. This is June Kaniko. And here's another uh, sculpture by Jun Kaneko as well. This one you can see is a, a coil built ball and a slab. Now this artist, Aiko uh, Kishi, Aiko is, um, is working with a very uh, precise geometry and you can really start to see some exciting things. A similar tilt that we saw in the uh, earlier pieces but here you have a really rigid geometry, and this is capable. You can do this by creating a piece, building a piece, and then uh, getting it very close to the finished form. And then after the piece is um, uh, leather hard, you begin to carve it, uh, and, and, and you can get really, really sharp lines and edges, as you can see here. And some very delicate work where she has um, a plain, that actually starts out in front of the plane below it. And then as it moves on, it falls back behind it. So this kind of overlapping that makes this lower plane look like it's coming forward. So very exciting interplay of these um, uh, rectilinear shapes and uh, a, very, a very powerful form. So this is her work and she does a number of different forms but she does uh, variations on this. Here you can see, um, a similar kind of form, but uh, with the same kind of very sharp geometry. But here, the surfaces are not as, um, it's a little more uh, lower relief. It's a very, uh, it, it's basically a one form that's shifting direction. Um, and then she's uh, scored lines uh, to get a sense of direction and then very carefully impressed holes all the way uh, through. So a lot of really diligent, careful work uh, to do these surfaces. And here's another one, a little quieter in terms of the activity, but when you start to look at it, what you see is you see that um, in addition, it's kind of a combination of the last two pieces, you have this um, beautiful uh, kind of uh, hard edge uh, geometry and then if you look a little closer, you see these very subtle uh, engraved lines, very slightly engraved lines. Now here's a different direction uh, for her. Um, and uh, this is a piece, you can see the, the tilt, but here there's, it's all, uh, it's all um, concave and convex and it's, it's, there's no uh, straight lines at all. It's quite an organic, uh, almost looks like a cellular division or something in this piece. So uh, Katsuama Chiko here, 
has a, another sculpture, which is kind of um, um, reminiscent of, of a cactus, um, some kind of uh, Sorraro cactus form or something. And you can see how carefully she has textured the surface. And then she's highlighted that by spraying, uh, she has a white glaze with a brilliant yellow glaze on the very top. And that's quite a powerful um, way to go about things. Uh, the previous sculptures we just saw were white um, and they had this kind of whitish pinkish surface, very subtle, very calming. And here it's, it's quite a startling color saturated yellow. And so you have um, the form that you're making and here you can see that um, Katsuo Mata San is doing this, um, this very textured surface, um, working on a very, very textured surface and then finishing with some really uh, great color. So you have those three things. You have the form, you have the texture, you have the color. All of those are variables that you can play with in your work. Now, Akiyama Yo, um, here uh, you can see that he is working uh, very much about, you know, he's got lots of interesting form going on, and then he's contrasting uh, this really uh, earthy, uh, almost geological broken texture with a very smooth surface, very smooth surface. So you get this amazing, uh, uh, beautiful texture, which, you know, taking advantage of what clay can do. But you can see running right through the middle of this image, you can see how he's got this uh, sharp line where he's controlling the form and making it both of these forms roll into each other. Here, we're going to look at uh, several of his pieces where he's he's interplaying. He's got um, this these really compelling forms that are put together with uh, really um, with quite powerfully uh, broken textured pieces of clay contrasting with some uh, smooth uh, surfaces. Here too, just bringing focus to the void in the center of this piece and contrasting it with all the activity of the texture on the uh, outside of this piece. Metavoid number 29. Here's another piece by the same artist using some of the same ideas. Another view of that piece. I thought this would be an interesting piece to, to look at um, just from the point of view of clearly three kind of flatter forms that are then lifted up and joined together when they're leather hard to create um, a really intriguing sculpture. And part of what makes this so intriguing is the, the again, it's got this three point stand on the ground, but there's so much you can see underneath it. He's activated the ground plane. One of the things you, you want to keep an eye out for as a ceramic sculptor, it's really easy to end up just kind of plopping the work down on the surface that you're working with. And pretty soon, you, you know, for stability's sake, you, you end up with this big old heavy chunk of stuff on the ground plane. And there is no necessary, there's no real reason to just clog up the ground plane with uh, heavy blocks of clay or something. Uh, you can animate that, lift that up and, and, and actually design what's going on underneath your pieces and activate the, um, the ground plane area as well. Ikuko Ando. Now, this is a piece I found, um, and uh, it's, this is my Martin Goreg, so uh, not Japanese. Uh, let's go back and look at it one more time. Um, I, I like the piece. I like the contrast between the relatively minimal, uh, simple form and the, um, the lovely uh, surface decoration of a, a dark clay body with some white slips uh, and um, then some darker 
uh, slips as well, to create this, this pattern of these uh, overlaying rectangles. Um, and then uh, what, I, what I came to understand is that um, Martin is marketing these not as uh, sculptures per se, but sculptures that you sit on. These, this is a stool that you can sit on. Couple of pieces here that I found intriguing. Um, we'll go back, I went a little fast on that. And you can see these two planes uh, of the same form uh, joined uh, at the base with um, some uh, kind of a, a curving upward base that joins these two wings together. And then as you can see in this one, the in-between space has a uh, another a third plane that is uh, kind of bending between the two of them, but the actual um, two sides are uh, complete exactly 180 degrees opposite of each other. But this was an an interesting standing piece. Um, it's a, again, a minimal kind of simple uh, geometry of this almost square. It's more of a rectangle with this uh, concavity in the center, um, slightly off center, of course. And then uh, these three protrusions in, in the very middle and then a very effective use of glaze to create some interplay of shape on the surface. Here you can see, um, again, this is kind of lifted up off the ground plane. The ground plane is a simple crescent that blossoms into these two um, slab, slab surfaces that curve around uh, and create uh, this really dynamic flowing form. And here a kind of monumental uh, piece with uh, some frosty white glaze uh, over the surface of a kind of a, a medium tan stoneware. And um, again, a contrast of texture and uh, geometry um, and a much looser, more uh, kind of spontaneous uh, direct handling of the material here. Miwa Kayuth. Kyotsu, Kyotsu, the eighth. I can't guarantee that that pronunciation is in any way correct. And I found this piece. So a lot. The, this presentation is really created by just looking for a kind of sculpture on the internet. And I did find a lot of Japanese doing it. This uh, is not uh, a Japanese uh, person. And one of the things you can see here, as long with that last almost square piece that we were looking at, is that when you have a, a very minimal surface that you put together when you, or a form, when you create a form that's kind of uh, simply what it is, then you can, if you choose, like this artist has, get more painterly with your composition and these three white rectangles with, uh, with holes in them um, become a very dynamic uh, composition on the surface and where you place uh, this, this horizon line of white to gray, um, your, your act, everything takes on such significance because the form itself is very quiet. And there is a relationship you'll notice between form, texture, color, uh, that is, uh, um, you, there's only so much information you can present. And in your composition, you may want to try to be subtle in some of those so that others can really sing rather than being loud in all three areas. This is a wonderful piece. I'm going to see if I can uh, move this point here a little bit. Now it's hard to see it. But um, this is a beautiful piece by uh, Scott Parody, who is a professor at uh, Sac State. Um, and uh, it's, it's a beautiful sculptural form that's wood fired. And it's um, at the very center of this large form, there is a little tiny hole. Uh, so um, it could be some kind of bud vase or something, but it's they can they can get as you can see in this case quite large, and they're very precariously balanced and just gorgeous forms worthy of contemplation. 
Here's another variation on that idea with this sort of honeycombed surface. And this is a piece we can kind of stroll around this and, and look at it from a, just a couple of views here. But you can see, again, a relatively simple geometry. And then uh, the artist is carving into the, uh, the block of the form that's presented to create um, more interest uh, with these internal shapes. It's almost an inside outside piece. And we'll just look at it as a slight, um, whoops, I think I've missed it here. No, I guess that's the only image I have of that one. Here is one with the relatively, um, a uh, simple form, it's got a little bit of uh, composition going on, and then a lot of activity with both texture and color. Um, so you can see that uh, the, the white uh, slip-like colors, the, the blue, the kind of navy blue and green, and then these dark lines uh, throughout, kind of a, looking like some manic sort of drawing surfaces. Uh, this is called Black Sail, Black Moon by Cheryl Zakaria. Zakaria? Eric Knock create, creates this piece for us. And here's a few pieces by, uh, by this artist uh, contrasting, again, some slab-like uh, flat planes with uh, some curved forms. This is Robert Strum, and I have quite a few of his to show you. This is also Robert Strum. So more Robert Strom, and here you'll see um, he's got different uh, shapes that he's developed and he's kind of uh, joining them together, leaving a clear indication that they were all at once separate pieces. Um, and he's using color to really uh, help them stand out from one another. And this is a taller piece by Strom. Again, the role of incising marks, uh, cut in lines is really effective here. And here is something that definitely looks like a torso uh, by Robert Strom as well. And that completes our presentation um, for this uh, enigmatic non uh, non-narrative sculpture. I can't wait to see what you come up with. So remember, stay safe and make lots of art.